Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Ruth Walker. I am a psychologist as well as a long-term member of the League of Women Voters. So what I'm going to do in this presentation is walk you through some of the really common barriers that people have that stop them from voting and talk about some of the solutions that we have out there that can help empower voters and encourage voters to get out there and vote. So let's go ahead and get started. So this is why we're here and why we're listening to this recording and watching this video is we want to talk about the people who aren't voting. Um, so voter turnout in the 2020 U.S. presidential election was at record-breaking levels. So here in the United States, we had a voter turnout rate of an estimated 71% of registered voters were there. And we had 29% of people not there. And so we wanted to talk about this 29% and how do we encourage more people that are eligible to vote to get to the polls and vote? And additionally, because we know 2020 was a record-breaking year, how do we keep the 71% that did come to the polls and vote, how do we keep them coming? How do we keep them engaged and keep them coming to the polls to cast their votes? So when we look here, if I did not vote was a candidate in the 2016 presidential election, they would have won in a landslide. So el voting eligible population, people who are eligible to vote over the age of 18 and considered a non-felon, over 92 million. When we look at the votes that were cast for former President Donald Trump, as well as Hillary Clinton, we can see that did not vote one. And so what we want to do is to change that around. Thankfully, in 2020, and the 2020 presidential election did not vote, would not have won. Um, but we've had many elections where this was the case and where people who did not vote had a stronger say in what was happening in the government. So compared to other developed countries, the United States has a pretty low voter turnout. Let's take a look at the data and, and look at a comparison here. So in countries where we have compulsory voting, so countries like Australia, where people are required to vote, voter turnout typically hovers in the 90s, so somewhere around 90%. You can see this data here is from 2022, so voters turned out at about 90%. In countries with automatic voter registration, so countries such as Argentina and the Netherlands, voter turnout is in the high 70s, low 80s. And so if we look at, for example, um, Argentina in 2019, their voter turnout rate was at 81%. If you look in the red part of the chart, so the United States 2020, remember this was a record-breaking year to have voters turn out to vote and cast their vote in at 71%, which is good for the United States, still compared to these other nations, is still pretty low. And some of that may be partially due to our lack of nationwide automatic voter registration and the lack of laws compared to some of these other countries requiring us to vote. So when we talk about um, what challenges and opportunities exist to empower our voters, I like to think of it on different levels. So for example, if we start at that smallest circle down there at the bottom, we have individual focused barriers as well as opportunities. So this might be um, an individual voter's knowledge, their beliefs, their attitudes, their demographics. So things like their age, their race, their income level. All of those can be things that um, create opportunities for people to come and vote or create barriers. We also have interpersonal focused systems. So this might be Things like social networks, coworkers, peers, family, friends, all of those things also contribute. We also have community focused, so community participation, non government organizations, um, access to resources, so things like polling locations, candidate information. And then we have at that upper level, we have what's called systems focused. So this might be national, state, and local laws and legislation. It may be organizations such as school um that those type of organizations or work organizations so 
what we have as a country is a problem that too many people are not using their right to vote for representatives that were vote on policies that impact their lives. And there are a lot of reasons for that. And there are a lot of reasons why people don't feel like their vote matters and don't exercise that right. So when we look at these challenges, we can see individual focused ones, such as lack of knowledge about candidates and their issues. We can also things see interpersonal focused ones, Voting isn't a norm or a part of your family values. Um, so I know in my family, voting isn't something that was ever discussed when I was growing up. We, no one talked about whether it was election day. Um, I didn't hear my parents talking about going to the polls to vote. And they didn't until I, um, I got a little bit older. And so that wasn't a norm. That wasn't something that I was socialized or taught to expect or to want to contribute in. And that was something that didn't happen until later in my life when I realized how important it was for me when I got to college. Community focused, we see like low number of polling locations, for example, or um, polling locations that might be in, not in um, accessible spots for people to get to. And then on systems focus, these are talking about things like policies. So here in the United States, we have policies that might restrict people's access to be able to vote. So we're going to talk about each of these different levels throughout this presentation. So we're going to talk about some individual focus barriers, as well as opportunities that we can work to empower voters, some that are interpersonal, some that are community focused, and some that are systems focused. So let's start out with systems focused challenges and opportunities and go through what some of these can look like. The very first thing is that when we're talking about voter turnout and how we have these differences in voter turnout, election type is one of the ways that we see differences come out. So low turnout, for example, is really pronounced in primary elections and off-year elections for state legislators. Um, so, for example, now in 2022, in our November election, we are going to be having an off-year election in that we're not voting for a president this year. So still voting for a lot of very important representatives for really important positions. But when we don't have a president on the ballot, people are less likely to show up to the polls, for example, um, as well as in local elections. So if we look at these charts here on the screen, we can see some of those differences in the statistics there. So looking at the chart on the left, you can see the lighter colors in the back is looking at voter turnout across all races and all ages. And if we look at the ones that are in the darker colors on the bottom, that's looking at voter turnout specifically for younger adults that are 18 to 24 years old. So if we look at that back portion, and look at voter turnout for across all races, we can see that we had some pretty good turnout in 2020, particularly compared to some of those earlier years. And if we look at the percent voting for congressional elections, so the chart on the left is looking at presidential elections, the chart on the right is looking at congressional elections, like what we have coming up in November. And you can see that even if we look at the lighter colors that we're looking across all races, that those numbers are lower than in presidential elections. People are less likely to show up at the polls to vote if it's for a congressional election than when we have a president on the ballot. And you can see that that also makes sense because in terms of getting people out to vote and hearing about it and hearing the media coverage and seeing things on the news or and then reading things in newspaper ads and things like that, we see a lot and we're inundated with a lot more for presidential elections. We also are having more conversations with our peers, our family members, our coworkers for presidential elections that is not necessarily taking place for these congressional elections. So let's look at some more data here. So there was and is an ongoing project by Portland State University. And what they do is they track and analyze local election turnout. Specifically, they look at who votes for mayor. And in summary, like the summarization of their findings is that turnout is abysmally low. So this table shows some of the cities with the highest and the lowest turnout rates in their most recent mayoral elections. So 
not only is the turnout for these local elections low, but it changes depending on some demographic factors. So even if we look at where in Fort Worth, Texas, for example, in their recent mayoral election, only 6% of voting eligible people living in that area showed up to the polls to vote. 6%. And we can see that Las Vegas, it was 9%. In Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, it was 12%. And where we find like the highest numbers over here is, so um, in Florida, you can see 47%. That's still less than half of the people that were eligible to vote showed up at the polls to vote for their mayor. And so this is a problem across all of these different local elections is that we don't have people showing up to the polls. They might not know that it's election day. They might not know who the candidates are. So we're gonna talk about some of those things, um, but it's an issue. And the people who are showing up to the polls are more likely to be people who are older, people who are white, people, who have a higher income. And so what ends up happening is that these people that are elected representatives at the local level are not necessarily representative of the people that are electing them. And so we don't have people from throughout those communities showing up at the polls to vote. And, and so we're missing a lot of voices. I live in Hamilton County in Chattanooga, um, Tennessee. So this is showing you some of that data. So Hamilton County, August 22 state primary election. This is almost like an opposite of what we saw in the 2020 presidential election graph that I showed you on the first slide, for example. Here, only 21% of people showed up to vote in Hamilton County in this primary election. 79% of eligible voters did not show up at the polls. This means that less than one out of four people voted in Hamilton County in their primary election. And this is not unusual data for local elections versus when we look at the 2020 presidential election, it was three out of four people showed up or almost three out of four people rather showed up to vote in that presidential election. So let's go, we're going to go back to this chart a couple of times just to see, like, we are talking about these different challenges and what can we do to combat that. Election timing is one of the factors that determines voter turnout. So voters are much more likely to turn out for these con consolidated even year voting elections, and they're more um they're motivated by these federal level or state level elections rather than local elections. So what people can do is change the timing of local elections to align with that. So if we know more people are going to show up to this uh, November 2020 congressional election than might show up for the April election, talking about like school board issues, for example, it would make sense to maybe switch that to voting in November when we know people are gonna show up to the polls and it would be more representative of the people that live in our area. So the city of Baltimore did do that. So when Baltimore shifted to on-cycle local elections, they did this in 2016, voter turnout soared from 13% of people showing up to vote to 60% of people showing up to vote. So we still have a lot of room to work with, but that's huge gains in terms of the people that are having a voice in local elections and, and in choosing who their local representatives are going to be. So research shows that participation in on-cycle local elections is at least double that of off-cycle local elections. So when we know that we have these, um, these low runoff elections or low um, turnout for these local elections, another thing that we could do is incentivize local elections um, and do local election promotions and advertisements and really promote that. So the Los Angeles Board of Education incentivized voter participation in its runoff election by giving each person who cast a vote an entry into a lottery that was worth $25,000. So Although when they surveyed people who had voted, 
only 4% said that they were motivated at all by that lottery. The rec election voter like turnout went from 1% to the previous runoff election all the way up to 10% for the election where they had that lottery. So it made a big difference and there was a big difference in voter turnout when they had that lottery or that incentive and the promotions that went along with it versus previous ones. So another thing that is impacting things is the competitiveness of that election. We know when these elections are more competitive, we are more likely to have people motivated to show up to the poll to vote. So voter turnout in the 2020 presidential election, when at the, um, the column that's on the left shows 69%, these 69% of eligible voters in our top 10 battleground states showed up to vote versus 66% in the other 40 states in um, the District of Columbia. So people are more likely to show up to vote in those battleground states. And I think this might paint a little bit of a clearer picture. So this graph shows the growth in voter turnout in three key battleground states in the 2020 election compared to the 2016 presidential election. So this growth was evident across white people who hadn't gone to college, uh, more moderately amongst white college graduates, and there were larger gains in the non-white population. So if we look across Georgia and Arizona and Texas, we can see across all of these different demographic groups, more people are showing up to vote. And when we look at um, our voters of color, particularly in the state of Arizona, for example, you can see a 17 point gain in the people that turned up in the polls to vote in that 2020 presidential election. If you look at Texas, you can see a nine point gain. And if you look in Georgia, we can see a five point gain. So when those states were more competitive and they were um, marketed more, and when these states are competitive, also the representatives who are running for different positions in that, such as the presidential election, they pay more attention to them. They have more um, media and advertising marketing dollars going into those. So it makes sense that we're focusing more on them on the front end. So we're gonna see more people show up to the polls on the back end. So coming back to our chart, and so knowing these things happen, that we have more people showing up when it's competitive, one of the things that we can do at a systems focus air level is push for national popular vote and ranked choice voting. So national popular vote, if you're not familiar with that, it would say that every vote in every state would be equally valuable in the election and it would expand presidential campaigns from just 10 battleground states to 50. So what that would mean is, is that if I am a Democrat living in a predominantly Republican state and I'm voting in the presidential election, my vote for president, because of the way that presidents are determined with the electoral college, ultimately doesn't matter. And the opposite is true. So if we have someone who is a member of the Republican Party living in a predominantly Democratic state where it's not a swing state, their vote also for president doesn't necessarily matter. People who are voting in these battleground states, their, their votes, they, they, it's not already written in stone who the electoral college is gonna give their votes for. And so their votes ultimately make people feel like they matter more because they are having more of a deciding range, particularly if their political party affiliation does not align with um, the general political party affiliation of the state that they live in. So voter turnout is lower in states that receive no presidential campaign attention. And that's what I had mentioned previously when we have these battleground states, the candidates are paying more attention to them, they're spending more marketing dollars. Um, and the reallocation of campaign resources to include non-battleground states could increase turnout in those states. So if they weren't guaranteed, if we didn't have this electoral college where um, it really went with the majority of a state, if each individual count voted, if we went based off of popular vote, then we might see increased voter turnout across all 50 states. Ranked choice voting is another option. And so 
what rank choice voting does is it allows voters to rank their choices in order and voters who might not feel like their views are represented in a two party race so pretending like we just have like two political parties um, would turn out to the polls and support their preferred candidates. So cities that have adopted ranked choice voting have ter seen ter voter turnout increase in recent mayoral elections across a variety of contexts. So looking at just a, a quick um, chart to show you some of the data to why national popular vote and and like the campaign to make that happen here in the United States has become more popular. So right now in the United States, we have a separation between the popular vote and who is elected president. So sometimes our president who gets the most votes, the popular vote also gets the most electoral votes, and sometimes they don't. And so you can see here, this is a short list of presidents who lost the popular vote, but won the electoral college. So most recently, you can see former President Trump, he lost the popular vote, but won the electoral college. So he became president. Former President Bush, same thing, Harrison and Hayes. So we have multiple occurrences where this has happened. And when that happens, there we have voters who feel like my vote didn't matter because even though the candidate I voted for got the most votes, they didn't ultimately became, become our president. And so having and pushing for national popular vote could help remedy that and help hopefully empower more voters to show up to the polls to vote in presidential elections. Voter turnout though varies a little bit more widely than that. It also varies by state. So um, in the 2020 presidential election, 80% of eligible voters in Minnesota cast ballots, whereas only 55% of eligible voters in Oklahoma cast ballots. So there are a lot of different factors that go into those wide ranges that we see in terms of voter turnout from state to state. So let's look at another chart. So this is voter turnout in the 2020 presidential election. And you can see the darker the blue is, the higher the voter turnout. The lighter the blue is, um, the lower the voter turnout was. So I live in the state of Tennessee. Voter turnout in the state of Tennessee was 59.8% in the 2020 presidential election. It's not awesome. Um, it, we have a lot of room for growth and improvement in the state of Tennessee to get that up. The good news is, that was, so there was a silver lining there, is that voter turnout for 18 to 29 year olds increased from 29% of 18 to 29 year olds showing up to vote in 2016 to 43% showing up to vote in 2020. So we have seen gains in some, in particular in our younger adult population in this state, which is pretty awesome. Um, but as you can see, we have a, a lot of states that have those really light blues and where the voter turnout just isn't as high and we don't have as many people showing up to the polls. So we talked about competitiveness. There are other factors that go into play in terms of determining how many people are showing up to the polls to vote. So other factors include things like voting laws. And they, those vary widely from state to state. Voter registration laws, voter identification laws, early voting, polling place accessibility, all of those different factors can impact um, how many people are showing up to the polls. So looking at this chart here, this is showing you differences in terms of voter photo ID laws across the United States. So voter ID laws, as you can see, um, if we look at like the gray areas, for example, those are states that don't have a voter ID law. And the darker blue the state gets, the stricter their voter ID legislation is. So as you can see, I've already told you I live in Tennessee. The state of Tennessee has some of the strictest voter ID laws in the country. So in Tennessee, you need to show a government issued photo ID to vote. These laws have been shown by researchers to lower voter turnout in general, in particularly for communities of color. Here in the United States, we have at least 11 million people who don't have government issued photo identification. And so those are millions of people who are left out if we have these photo ID laws in place. Additionally, multiple research studies have been published in the last five years that empirically show that these strict laws, such as voter ID laws, 
disproportionately impact and decrease voter turnout in communities of color. So I want to read you a quote from a study that analyzed, they analyzed data um, at the county level, so countywide data across the United States, and they wanted to look at the impact of voter suppression laws. So I want to read you the results and some of the things that they said. So they said, the findings presented here strongly suggest that these laws do, in fact, represent a major burden that disproportionately affects minorities and significantly alters the makeup of the voting population. Where these laws are enacted, turnout in racially diverse counties declines. It declines more than in less diverse areas, and it declines more sharply than it does in other states. As a result of these laws, the voices of racial minorities become more muted and the relative influence of white America grows. So researchers studying the impact of strict voter ID laws in North Carolina found that the enactment of a law reduced turnout. Further, even if um, that law was restricted and like turned over, for example, so let's say, a state has a really strict voter ID law and they take it off the books and, and they reverse that. It still impacts voter show, like turnout after, in the aftermath of that. So it is lower even after those voter ID laws are repealed. Specifically, let me give you some data. So after the law was suspended in North Carolina, people with an out of photo ID were 2.6 percentage points less likely to turn out in the 2016 general election and 1.7% less likely to turn out in the 2016 general election. So the ramifications and the long-term impact of these le legislation and strict voter ID laws, they last over time. Another thing that's impacting voter turnout is roll purges. So some states have removed thousands and sometimes hundreds of thousands of voters from their voter registration rolls. So Brennan Research Center found that between 2014 and 2016, states removed almost 16 million voters from the rolls a 33% increase over the period from 2006 to 2008. And according to the Brennan Center, these practices disproportionately disenfranchise people of color. Again, so oftentimes, and this is a common theme across these voter ID laws and these voter suppression laws is that they are disproportionately impacting our voters of color. Another thing um, that has happened is there has been some legislation to, uh, or proposed legislation, I should say, to eliminate Sunday voting in some states. So this is another type of voter suppression law, and it doesn't always get as much notice. Um, and so Sunday voting is especially important for Black worshipers um, and people who go to church. And so um, in the state of Georgia, there was law um, it was proposed, I'm sorry, looking for the word, proposed to eliminate this, to eliminate Sunday voting. And um, in the state of Georgia, in these religious communities, it was very common to encourage people to go to church to vote after Sunday services. And some of these initiatives are known as souls to polls. And so researchers have found that voters of color were substantially more likely to vote on Sundays in Georgia than white voters. So researchers conducting a different study had found that these Sunday voters do not transition to other days. So if you take away the Sunday voting opportunities, it's not like they're just going on another day of the week to do it. So when Sunday voting was outlawed in Florida, for example, back in 2012, Black voters who voted on Sunday in 2008 were much more likely to abstain from voting in 2012 and to, to not show up for the next election. Again, just another example of a voter suppression law that is disproportionately impacting communities of color. Another um, piece of legislation that is impacting it is voter registration deadlines. And again, there's a lot of variability from state to state in terms of what these deadlines look like. So we have um, some states that don't require voter registration. We have some states that have same day registration um, for early voting. Um, and we also have 
different timelines in terms of how soon before that election do you need to be registered to vote? 15 to 17 days, um, one to 14 days, 28 to 30 days. So there are all of these differences out there. So the state of Tennessee is one of the stricter voter registration deadlines in the country. So in this state, um, voters are required to register 30 days prior to the election versus in if we look at um, a state such as North Dakota, they can have same day registration on election day and just show up to the polls and vote. It does impact people to have those really strict deadlines. So this is a graph it's showing the days on which Georgia showed the state of Georgia saw the most people registered to vote prior to the 2018 election. So if you look on this chart here, you can see there's a big peak there where the registration deadline is. And all of those registrations in red are people that registered after that registration deadline and were not able to vote in the 2018 election because they had registered after that deadline. If they lived in a state where they didn't have that registration deadline, they could have shown up to the polls to vote and registered the same day. And so what we have are people who are unable to vote because they have those strict deadlines in place. So opportunities to empower voters. So thinking about some of the opportunities we have here at the systems focus level. So what kind of policies can we impact? Universal and automatic voter registration policies. We can have same day voter registration. We can um, push back against roll purges and stop roll purges from happening. And I know organizations such as the ACLU and the League of Women Voters are, are trying to fight for and against these things. Um, and then vote against voter suppression laws when they come on the ballot. Sometimes they do a really nice job of making them seem like common sense legislation, for example, like it, it and positioning it that way and marketing it that way. Like it's just common sense that someone would show their photo ID, not recognizing that that impacts 11 million people in the United States who don't have voter registration um, and are like a, a photo ID to be able to take to the polls to vote. And another thing that you could do is protest voter suppression laws. So in the state of Georgia, I had mentioned that they proposed the eliminating Sunday voting. And I can tell you that those religious leaders and community members and people of color showed up to vote, and, um, showed up to protest and to talk to representatives and show that that was not okay with them. And it ended up being taken out of that legislation. So um, having that protest and that criticism does make a difference and can very much make a difference. And we can do that both at a community focus level. So organizations and in this case, churches were helping with that, but also at an individual level. So you as an individual can go and protest and write to your representative and call your representative and let them know how you feel about those things. So some individual focus challenges and opportunities. So let's talk about some of the things that are impacting people on a personal level. So first thing is that voter turnout very much varies by demographics. And I know I've mentioned this earlier, but voters who show up to the polls are more likely to be older. They're more likely to be white. They are more likely to be women. And they're also more likely to have higher income. So um, when we look at specifically race, for example, in 2020, voter turnout amongst eligible white voters was estimated to be around 73% versus voter turnout amongst Black voters was at 66%, and Hispanic voters was around 53%. And so why is that? Why do we have these big gaps and these disparities between people of different races showing up at the polls to vote? Some of it has to do with historically where we've been as a country. So this is a, an abbreviated history of voting rights in the United States, not going into a ton of detail, but Back in the late 1700s, our first people who were eligible to vote were white men and they had to be landowners. And then eventually they gave the rights to make those decisions about who was eligible to vote to the states. And then we had a lot of variability in terms of who was eligible from state to state. At the federal level in 1870, we had the 15th Amendment um, passed. It gave black men the right to vote. 
You can see a little asterisk next to that. And that means that not all black men were had the right to vote. And the reason for that is that um, states ended up adding requirements for people to be able to vote. And so we saw these different barriers in the form of poll taxes requiring people to pay to vote. And we also saw it in the form of literacy tests requiring people to pass a literacy test in order to be able to cast a vote. So a lot of black men were turned away at the polls and unable to vote even with the 50th amendment in place because of these additional barriers that were put in place. 1920 is a date that we um, oftentimes hear celebrated. That's when the 19th amendment was passed to give women the right to vote. You see another asterisk there because again, not all women. Black women showed up at the polls to vote after that 19th Amendment was passed and were turned away. And um, again, and some of that was due to some of those additional barriers that were placed and also some of the leeway that these states had in terms of enforcing them. So you can see 1924, the Indian Citizenship Act, giving Native Americans the right to vote, another asterisk, because not all of them and not all states were recognizing and enforcing it. 1943, Chinese Exclusion Act end, giving Chinese Americans the right to the right to have citizenship as well as the right to vote. But again, not all of them. Um, 24th Amendment, 1964, banned poll taxes, so states could no longer charge people to be able to vote. And then 1965, finally, we had the Voter Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, which banned literacy tests and enforced the 15th Amendment. So it wasn't until 1965 that men and women of color were able to vote in all 50 states around the country. And we have still seen where we have had additional barriers put in place that we've had to work on. And the final big piece of legislation in terms of voting rights to be aware of is in 1971, um, after sending several young men and women um, to Vietnam, they realized that maybe we shouldn't ask someone to give up their life and, and not give them the right to vote. So at that point in time, voting age was 21 and older. And so that lowered that age to 18 years old. Looking at this and looking at and knowing that 1965 is truly the year when a lot of people in the United States were given the right to vote, not these earlier years, that's not very long ago. And so what we have is we have generational history in the United States of certain groups of people being told that they are not allowed to vote, their vote doesn't matter, their vote doesn't count, and their vote isn't wanted. And so we have still a long way to go to come back from what has been pushed onto their families for decades. There is a lot of issues additionally, particularly since the 2020 election with a lack of trust in the election process. So it is not unusual for people who vote in presidential elections to be more confident that their vote counts if the person they voted for won, right? So if the person I voted for won, I'm like, oh, yay, you know, democracy is working. Um, but if someone I voted for didn't win, people may feel less confident. So that is fairly typical. However, the amount of distrust that has been present since 2020 election is, is unheard of historically. So a 2021 survey by the, the Public Religion Institute found that 68% of Republicans mostly or completely agree that the election was stolen, um, and comparatively 6% of Democrats do as well. So these views have become increasingly common despite the fact that there is no evidence to back it up. So extensive research shows that fraud is very rare and not common. I remember once listening to um, a county clerk talk about election fraud and um, talk in support of voter ID laws. And he was telling us um, an anecdotal story about a particular election where the vote was decided by one person. And he said that there was someone who had registered to vote in two counties and so they could have an impact on this local election. And so they fraudulently registered in two places and they went two places and voted in two places. And he said that determined that election and that that person um, was elected to that office. 
that story is incredibly rare. And that story also is something that would not have been rectified with a voter ID law because the person was registered to vote and their voter ID would, would show that that is who they are, but it didn't stop the fact that they registered in two different places. So some of these voter ID laws that have been put in place to stop types of fraud that, again, are very rare and are not very common, um, would not have even stopped the type of fraud that had happened in that particular case. So some other barriers at this individual level that are happening. So some people don't know how to register to vote. So that makes the work of people like the League of Women Voters and NAACP going out and registering voters at events so important. They don't know where to vote. They don't have approved voter identification. They lack transportation to their polling location, inconvenient polling locations, long lines at polling locations. That was happening a lot in the 2020 voting. Um, polling machine malfunctioning, conflicts with work. Um, a belief that their vote doesn't matter, and a lack of knowledge about the state and local candidates and their issues. So in terms of what can we do about this at these different levels, so some systems-focused initiatives that we could do, we can make the voting process more transparent to voters, make early and absentee voting more accessible. Um, so here in the state of Tennessee, you can do absentee voting, but you have to mail in a form to request an absentee ballot be sent to you, and then the ballot is sent to you, and then you fill it out, and then you send it back in. So it's this back and forth process, and the more steps you have in the process, the more barriers you're putting in place, the less likely that people will be to be able to vote. So making these things more accessible, easier for people to to um, gain access to would be important. More polling locations, free transportation on election day to those voting locations, things like that. And there are different organizations out there that do offer those things that will help with people getting transportation. There are some cities out there that will have free public transportation on election days. So there are some things in place. And when they are, that does help people to be able to access those services and access the ability to vote. So some interpersonal focus strategies is things like peer pressure, making voting a social norm, expressing gratitude, asking for a commitment. So I'm gonna go over some different research studies where researchers have looked at some of those different strategies and talk about what those look like. And finally, a last one is educating voters on the importance of local elections. So a lot of these different elected representatives that are happening at the local level, so um, representatives such as county clerks who have such an important role and it goes even beyond handling like voter registration and handling election days. They, they just have so many pieces to what they're doing for their counties and people don't know what that is and they don't know why it's important to and how that impacts their daily lives. So one of the things that I am currently doing is I, I teach a course where I have students do experiential learning and some of the students in that class as part of their experiential learning is doing research into this. So what are these representatives, these local elective representatives, what do they do and why does it matter to me and why should I care when I'm going to the polls? So those types of things are really important and getting that kind of messaging and education out is also super important to be able to do. So one of the ways and one of the really common things that people say that is a barrier is I, I don't know who these candidates are. And one way that you could do that is by using resources such as vote411.org. So this provides voters with nonpartisan information about candidates at all levels of government. This is really a labor of love by League of Women Voters across the nation, and it helps voters have kind of like a one-stop shop to access information to help them be informed when they're going to the polls. So what can we do, though, about that eroding trust? Thankfully, there is a lot of things out there and strategies that we can do to try to help restore trust in the election process. So some things we can do before an election is install ballot tracking systems. So particularly with the pandemic and more people voting by mail, have a way where they can track their ballot to see that it's getting to the plate, getting back to 
the people that are going to count it, we can update and test out voting equipment. So we're not gonna have malfunctions and issues on the day of the election, which will make people less likely to trust the process. We can partner with Vote Shield. So this is a web-based application that helps protect voter registration systems. Um, and so that is a, just another way of ensuring integrity of data that places can do. Um, another way is to implement what's called adoptive precinct programs. So this can increase transparency and accountability by recruiting different organizations in the community to get involved in that process. So for example, um, for an, the November election in Palm Beach County, Florida, a Black women's service organization worked at a predominantly Black precinct. And so this group helped quell distrust and increase voter turnout by encouraging voters to come to the polls. And they encouraged them to come to the polls dressed in their finest attire. Um, and so they may, they were able to campaign and encourage people in that precinct by adopting that particular polling location with a local community organization with people that that local community would be more likely to trust. Um, there's also other ways that you can do this. Um, by, so in 2018, California's Secretary of State emailed 6 million registered voters for the first time to provide them with trusted election information. So what they did is they told them that they were working with VoteSure and they provided them with information um, about election misinformation and they delivered local um, election resources, particularly to hard to reach voters. Also sending out like email newsletters and things like that to people in local areas can help with those things as well. There are things we can do after an election. So hosting live streaming of ballot counting. So I know this happened post the 2020 election where some of those counties had live streaming, had people in there recording when people were recounting and auditing some of the ballots to help increase the transparency and the trust in that process. Conducting risk limiting audits, sharing updates about audits, and being transparent about when mistakes are made. So if a mistake has been made in terms of like, and it comes up in an audit or in a recount, being transparent with voters about that and correcting it. Um, for several states, including Georgia and Michigan, they conducted risk limiting audits for the first time um, this year, and they're designed to detect errors, to check accuracy, and to make sure that votes are being counted properly. And um, some other states, such as like Colorado and Virginia and Rhode Island, Require these audits, and some nine other states have pilot programs and optional risk limiting aud um, audits. So the integration and the growth of those types of methods are also ways of ensuring the public's trust that that um, their vote is being counted and it's being audited appropriately. So some other things that different researchers have studied, um, gratitude expression. So just thanking voters for voting in a previous election boosts participation in subsequent elections. Another thing is asking for commitment. So, and this is really great. If you sign into the NAACP's website on their main website, they ask just that of people visiting the website. They say, commit to vote in the next election, commit to electing representatives that are going to represent you and have people sign up. Asking for a commitment can increase voter turnout. So this set of researchers that did the study in 2018 found that pledging to vote increased voter turnout by 3.7 points amongst all subjects, and then 5.6 points amongst people who had never voted before. Another easy strategy is sending out a reminder. So the 2010 primary election in California, researchers sent this message just via text to cell phones of more than 14,000 voters, and it boosted turnout from 8.9 to 9.8%. They did find and um, suggest that emails are, are not effective. We don't, we don't always read our emails, we delete them. And, and so that was an effective strategy, but this texting strategy was helpful. And when we do reminders, if we send more reminders, it's more helpful. Um, so this chart is just showing all the way to the right, 45% uh, turnout for people who were never contacted, 
61% people contacted before October, 62% um, people showed up contacted during October. When people were contacted before and during October, voter turnout was 78%. So the more we contact people, the more likely they are to show up to the polls as well. Um, and this is just showing you an example of what maybe we don't want to do. Um, so there are some types of messages that we could do that might have um, the opposite effect that we want. So this was one strategy is, is sending voters their grade in terms of um, what their grade was for how often they're showing up to the polls to vote. And these type of heavy handed social messages can backfire on you. So you want to be really cautious about doing things like this. Um, these voting vo violations here shown in the image, uh, Ted Cruz had sent them out in 2016 and people did not respond positively to that. We don't want to be told that we're getting an F or we're doing a bad job. So let's talk about some interpersonal focused opportunities. So I'm a psychologist. So these interpersonal messages are things that oftentimes um, political science researchers and, and psychologists are studying to see like how can we impact each other in terms of showing up to vote. So peer pressure strategies are one of them. So people who are on Facebook um, on election day where they have people tag that I voted and you can see the counters and you can see on those counters like the pictures of your friends and family members and people that voted that makes an impact. So researchers estimate that about 340,000 extra people turned out to vote in a 2010 U.S. congressional election because of an election day Facebook message. And Facebook estimated that the message itself nudged about 60,000 people who received it into voting and a further 280,000 people were triggered to vote as those kind of I voted ripples um, went from friend to friend. We also can see that letting people know and, and sending out letters, letting them know if they have voted and knowing that that information is public can have an impact. So 80,000 Michigan voters received letters before a 2006 primary. And this threat of being watched or having someone watch their voting behavior did increase voter turnout. So it led to an 8.1% increase in voter participation. And that was one of the highest of any voter intervention um, that had been used before that time. So this was an older study, but um, it, it was published in 2008. But up to that time, it, it had a pretty significant impact. We can also see this is a more recent study. Um, and it's just showing that increasing the perceived observation or like making people think that someone's going to call or talk to them or observe this voting behavior does impact. So these are showing um, get out the vote letters. And in some of the letters, there would be this box that you see up in that upper right hand corner. And it said, you may be called after the election to discuss your experience at the polls. And so if the letters included that information, it increased people's perception that someone's going to watch or um, contact me afterwards, and they were more likely to show up to vote. So you can see here, we have the typical letter, which didn't include that I'm watching you and I might contact you afterwards, versus the, the letters where that was included, they saw significant increases in terms of how many people were showing up to vote. Another type was just looking at a voter report card. So a little bit similar to what Ted Cruz had sent out in 2016. The, the difference here is that it's a little bit more positive. Um, so not showing a comparison between you and your neighborhood rather than giving these individual report cards. So move on sent vote scores to 12 million um, different voters. They gave voters a score indicate whether they indicate more or less often than their neighborhood average. And so they found that this was also a fairly effective tool at increasing some voter turnout. So I wanna show you one example of how we can put together some of these interpersonal strategies and these peer strategies to be able to increase voting. So Northwestern University started piloting um, this project. And what they did is when students showed up to the university, 
they were greeted by a peer, so another student, and that other student would explain to them how voting works. It would give them their voting options. So you can register to vote here where Northwestern University is, or you can register to vote back home and get absentee ballots to vote. So they would assist them with their registration, getting registered to vote if they weren't, if they were voting from, um, if they wanted to vote for their home election, they would assist them with an absentee ballot application. So what they found is that 95% of eligible students register to vote using this tactic. 71% of successful absentee votes for every 100 students and um, 79 successful votes for every 100 students for the people who were choosing to vote in Illinois. So you can also see in this chart here, comparison from 2012 to 2016. So 49% of students voting um, in 2012, 64% in 2016. They made it a norm. They made it a normative part of the culture there at that um, university and they put it between peers and had them socialize them and give them the information and that significantly increased the voter turnout. So some different organizations that I would recommend working with if this is something that is meaningful to you that you care a lot about, lots of amazing organizations. So I just wanna highlight a couple of them. So the League of Women Voters is definitely one of them. The League of Women Voters in the United States, they encourage informed and active participation. They are a nonpartisan organization and they really work to increase on education, helping educate people on public policies issues um, through advocacy, getting people to register to vote. They, I had mentioned previously, um, really are behind that vote411.org, giving people candidate information. They also will host candidate forums, debates. People of all genders are welcome to join and encouraged to join. The ACLU is another great organization. They work actively and consistently to protect and expand Americans' freedom, and they work on fighting um, in the courtroom, uh, voter suppression laws, gerrymandering, promoting access to the ballot, defending the voting right acts, um, restoring rights to people who have lost the right to vote. So when some of these different pieces of voter suppression legislation go into play, they're ones out there doing the work to fight it in the courtroom. Other organizations do as well. Sometimes the League of Women Voters will step in, but the ACLU is oftentimes doing a lot of that heavy lifting. Another amazing organization to get involved in is the NAACP. So historically, the NAACP has brought important cases to the Supreme Court. So they're also doing some of that legislative heavy lifting. Um, so they have brought things like grandfather clauses, all white primaries, literacy tests, gerrymandering, um, felony disenfranchisement, voter identification laws. So if you go to their main website, as I mentioned too, they're asking people who visit their website, make a pledge to vote. Um, so they're doing a lot of work. They've also published a book on the voting rights war and talking about the struggle for justice that I would recommend. They're doing amazing work. If you wanna get involved in an organization, that's another great one to consider. There are so many others. So this is just a few. So I'm in Tennessee. So I think Tennessee is one, Common Cause, Rock the Vote, um, Headcount, Voter Empowerment Project. You can link more that you can think of in the comments. There are honestly so many different opportunities to get involved and do something. Um, if it, you wanna get involved in your league and help them to register voters, go out and do some of that voter education, canvassing. Um, that's always a great opportunity. So if you have questions for me or additional comments, suggestions, resources, please feel free to leave those in the comments for other watchers, but that would be really helpful. And thank you so much for tuning in.